I think I'm doing good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I am Janae Kizzy, Events Coordinator at Providence Public Library. And I'm Christina Babalacqua. I'm Programs and Exhibitions Director at Providence Public Library. Um, welcome to tonight's program with Dr. Richard Bell on his new book, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home. Tonight's event is part of PPL's 2020 exhibition and program series, The King is Dead, asterisk, which focuses on how the news guides our daily activities, gives us current information, and does or doesn't relate to the facts. Originally scheduled for April through June, the, exhibit, um, the exhibition part of the series has been rescheduled for October 1st through December 31st. The remaining programs in this series will take place this fall when the exhibition is on view. A few technical notes. Um, as I said in the chat, uh, closed captioning is available. You can just send me a message in the chat if you uh, would like for it to be turned on. Um, if you would like for it to be turned on, you'll be able to view it as an alternate screen during Dr. Bell's presentation. Um, in addition to that, you'll be muted throughout and you can feel free to send any questions you have for Dr. Bell um, during the presentation and he will answer them as he sees fit at the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, if you have any technical questions during the event, please feel free to send them directly to me. As you can see, you can um, chat directly to Christina, Dr. Bell, or I during the event. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks again, everybody, for attending tonight's event. Um, just the first thing, tomorrow as a follow-up, you will get an evaluation by email. It's short and sweet, and it's very important to us. Um, it's important for us to be able to evaluate our programming. It helps us improve what we offer, and also it's very crucial to our fundraising efforts, so please send that back. Um, we're delighted tonight to have our presenter, Richard Bell. He is a scholar, writer, and teacher at the University of Maryland, where he is an associate professor of history. His research focuses on the history and culture of the United States between 1750 and 1877. His first book, We Shall Be No More, Suicide and Self-Government in the Newly United States, examined the role that discourse regarding self-destruction played in the cultural formation of the early republic. He also co-edited excuse me, Buried Lives, Incarcerated in Early America, a volume of essays centered on the experience of incarcerated subjects and citizens in early America. His newest book, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home, which is a wonderful book, is the subject of his talk tonight. You'll find two links in the chat enabling you to purchase the book. To purchase a signed copy from Dr. Bell, please email him at rjbell at umd.edu. There's also a link for ordering an unsigned copy from Bookshop, which is an online site that benefits independent booksellers. So thank you, Dr. Bell, for being with us, and thank you, everybody, and I turn it over to you. Hey, goodness. I never get used to doing these things online on Zoom. It always feels weird. Uh, so thank you for bearing with us. And thank you to Christina uh, and uh, Janea for uh, this invitation. This was supposed to be live. We were supposed to be in Providence, uh, but here we are. We could be anywhere, right? All of you, all the heads in the boxes, you could be anywhere on earth. Um, so thank you for being here this evening. I'm gonna try and share my screen first of all and hope that goes well. Um, let's see how that goes. Uh, I think you can see, yes, I think you can see a book cover against a black background. Janae is nodding. Um, I'm going to speak for about 35 uh, minutes, and uh, I hope in the course of what I have to say, you, uh, you will uh, be bold and think up a question or two and uh, send them to me in the chat, uh, and then I can uh, take up some of those questions. We can have a more interactive discussion uh, later on. And, you know, ask me absolutely anything. Um, I'm very open about this sort of stuff. Um, you'll see from the title of the book uh, that this is about some sobering stuff, uh, so do, do bear that in mind as we get stuck in. Okay. Cornelius Sinclair was 10 years old and he was trapped. He was stuck, he was locked in the belly of a small ship that was bobbing in the middle of the Delaware River about a mile south of Philadelphia. 
A man had grabbed him from a spot near Philadelphia's city market an hour ago, shoved a black gag into his mouth, tossed him into a wagon and hauled him here. And it was dark below the waterline of that little ship, but Cornelius could see just enough to know that he was not alone down there in the hold. Four other pairs of eyes stared back at him, four other black boys. One looked about his age, he was maybe 10, 11 years old like Cornelius. Two more were older, taller, perhaps 14 or 15 years old. The last of them was shorter and smaller than the rest. He might have been as young as 80 years old. Yesterday, all five boys had been free, like you and me. But now suddenly they were slaves prisoners of a gang of child snatchers who plan to sell their lives and their labors, most likely to plantation owners in the deep, deep South. If their abductors got away with this, 10-year-old Cornelius Sinclair would spend the rest of his life as someone else's property somewhere very far away. He would probably never see his friends or his family again. Cornelius disappeared in late August, 1825, one of dozens of African-American children to vanish in very similar circumstances that single year alone. And in the early 19th century as a whole, the city of Philadelphia was the hub of American slavery's blackest market. Philadelphia's gridded streets, its tangled alleys were hunting grounds for crews of professional kidnappers who made their livings turning free black kids like Cornelius into southern slaves. They did this work swiftly and shamelessly in brazen affront to Philadelphia's reputation at the time as the city of brotherly love, as a safe haven for people of color, and as the headquarters of America's anti-slavery movement at the time. But to kidnappers, to criminals, to human traffickers, none of that stuff mattered. And in truth, early 19th century Philadelphia was probably one of the most dangerous places to be free and black anywhere in the United States. And that was a product of its location. At the time, it was the nearest free city to the slave south. Philadelphia was about 40 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line that separated Pennsylvania from several other states like uh, Virginia and Maryland to the immediate south. And as Pennsylvania and other northern states had slowly disentangled themselves from race slavery in the 50 or so years after the American Revolution, that boundary running along Pennsylvania's southern border became ever more important, especially for African Americans. By 1825, the year that Cornelius was kidnapped, that Mason-Dixon line seemed to divide two worlds, separating northern free states from southern slave states. And Philadelphia's proximity to that frontier line made its many free black residents attractive targets for professional people snatchers. They would prey on the members of this city's black community relentlessly, putting bullseyes on their backs, putting prices on their heads. And the people they stole away could fetch anywhere up to $15,000 per person in today's money in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Alabama, three of the new territories and states that were rising up along the Gulf Coast at exactly this time. The American settlers swarming into that region demanded, needed, they said, a nearly bottomless supply of forced manpower to cut sugarcane and to pick cotton down there. They would take almost anyone to do that work they didn't want to do themselves, including, it seems, children as young as 10-year-old Cornelius. Now, buying some of their enslaved laborers from kidnappers was not likely their first choice, but these would-be slave owners had limited options by 1825. Planters in the Deep South had been forced to look to domestic sources within the United States for their manpower needs ever since 1808. Now, 1808 is not a hugely famous year in American history. It's not nearly as famous as 1776, 
1865 or, or 1968, but something important happened in 1808 that would shape American slavery forever after. In 1808, a new law goes into effect in Washington, D.C., which bans, outlaws, further legal American participation in transatlantic slavery. Uh, so that 1808 decision, in retrospect, turns out to be a major turning point in the history of slavery in America, a turning point that would spur the growth of an internal slave trade, sometimes called a domestic slave trade, here within the existing slave states of the United States. After that 1808 decision, interstate slave traders here in the U.S. tried to satisfy those southwestern settlers' demands for black labor by bringing them thousands of American-born slaves each and every year from existing slave states like Virginia, like Delaware, like Maryland, where I'm talking to you from tonight. That's the domestic slave trade, wholly legal. But settlers down in the Deep South wanted even more. And the more they were willing to pay, the more tempting and profitable it became for anyone sufficiently cold-blooded to try to kidnap free black children like Cornelius from northern cities like Philadelphia, smuggle them into the legal supply chain, and sell them in that vast new southwestern slave market. Those economic incentives left Philadelphia's large and dynamic free black uh, community dangerously exposed. By 1825, the city of brotherly love had become the center of an inter-regional kidnapping operation. It had become the northern terminus of what I refer to in my scholarship as the reverse underground railroad. So you'll hear me say that phrase, reverse underground railroad, a few times uh, this evening. And I want to be clear what I mean about it right from the top. I mean, I'm referring to the kidnapping of free black Americans from within the United States uh, with the intention of selling them as slaves in the South, the reverse underground railroad. And that reverse underground railroad, and its much better known namesake, the underground railroad, they of course ran in opposite directions, right? And they existed for completely different reasons, right? But in some ways they are actually mirror images of each other. On the Underground Railroad, that's the good one, the famous one, the Harriet Tubman one, on the Underground Railroad, enslaved people would abandon southern plantations and trek northward, dreaming of new lives and new opportunities in freedom. On what I'm calling the Reverse Underground Railroad, free black people vanished from northern towns and cities and were made to trudge southward to be sold into plantation slavery. On the Underground Railroad, conductors like Harriet Tubman would risk their own lives and their own liberty to help these black fugitives make these epic journeys of freedom. On what I call the reverse Underground Railroad, the conductors and station agents were kidnappers and human traffickers motivated by money. Both of these networks, one obviously good and heroic, the other one I think monstrous and evil, roared to life in the early 19th century to exploit what by then had become major differences in the legal status of slavery in the northern states versus the southern states. Both of these networks were loosely organized, um, highly opportunistic. They both relied on small circles of trusted participants, on forged documents, on false identities, on disguise. Uh, the direction of travel was of course different, but if you saw the routes on a map taken by freedom seekers, sometimes going north, and by victims of kidnapping generally going south, the routes on a map were largely the same. They might even have passed one another on the roads from time to time. And what's more, the size of these two railroads, the volume of traffic was roughly the same. Each and every year in the first 60 years of the 19th century, hundreds if not thousands of enslaved African Americans risked everything to escape slavery on the Underground Railroad. And each and every year in the first 60 years of the 19th century, 
hundreds, if not thousands, of legally free African Americans had that freedom stolen from them with the intent of their being sold into slavery. Most Americans, I hope, know a good deal about the Underground Railroad. Historians have spent, what, more than 150 years now studying the tactics and the strategies that conductors like Harriet Tubman used to uh, help freedom seekers escape from slavery. The achievements of folks like Tubman are finally moving to center stage in American popular um, culture. Uh, we've got walking tours about the Underground Railroad. We've got um, visitor centers. There's a great one near me on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, there's the museum, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. Um, and we've got this movie that came out six months ago, uh, Harriet, the first time Tubman had ever been given center stage in uh, a Hollywood film. Um, this is not a perfect film, it's not my favorite film, but I'm really glad it exists and that it draws attention to her uh, story and to the larger story of the Underground Railroad. Um, I, study American, I study American history for a living despite this British accent, um, and I spend most of my time before the Civil War, and the more time I spend with the many Americans I study in that pre-Civil War period, generally speaking, the less I like them and less I admire them, which is to say, it's quite hard to find real heroes in American history. But if you are looking for real heroes in American history, um, the lady on the screen, Harriet Tubman, is where you start. And uh, the Underground Railroad is full of American heroes. So we're starting to learn a lot about the Underground Railroad. We know far less, I think, about what I'm calling this evening the reverse Underground Railroad. Its conductors, its station agents worked tirelessly to remain untouchable. And the identities of all but a handful of these criminals, these monsters, these traffickers still remain unknown to us more than 150 or so years later. Uh, the criminals who built the underground, the reverse Underground Railroad never went on lecture tours to advertise their work. They never went on fundraising tours to advertise their work. Only rarely do their names and their crimes appear in surviving police files or trial transcripts. That low profile in surviving legal sources, the result of the years they spent in the shadows, protected by bribes, protected by corruption, and protected by an unholy amount of indifference to what they were doing by people who knew exactly what they were up to. Unlike legal interstate slave traders who sometimes bequeathed their papers to southern colleges and southern historical societies, the criminal outlaws who built this reverse underground railroad left no business papers, no bundles of private letters for historians like me to read or examine. They did not write memoirs about their careers. They did not pose for paintings or photographs either leaving crusading journalists of the day to guess at what they might have looked like. And that's what you're looking at here. It's one of the first of several obvious connections between the theme of the Providence Public Library's uh, current exhibit, uh, The King is Dead, asterisk, uh, about news uh, and this particular project. There, are, there were crusading journalists who took a strong interest in exposing, in bringing to light, in shining sunlight upon uh, these monsters, and you see one of their efforts in the form of this graphic illustration drawn in the 1820s by a crusading Philadelphia journalist named Jesse Torrey. But my point is that they didn't leave many traces. Nevertheless, as I argue in this new book, Stolen, these professional kidnappers nonetheless left their mark everywhere on 19th century America. If we think not just about Philadelphia, where this true story begins, but about every northern town and city, um, including Providence, including Boston, including New York City, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, you name it. If we think not just about 1825, when this true story begins, but about every single year in the first 60 years of the 19th century, we can say with tragic certainty that these kidnappers stole away tens of thousands of free black people, many of them children like 
Cornelius Sinclair, who were under the age of 16. Most of those they kidnapped could not read or write. And to be clear, most of those they kidnapped were never heard from again. Their parents and friends would search, petition, would advertise in newspapers, and I'll show you one such ad a bit later on, but they would wait in earnest for any sort of good news about the whereabouts of their children and how they could get them back, and usually that news never came. Free black people in northern cities like Philadelphia had very few white allies at this period in American history, beyond the meager ranks of a few Quaker-led anti-slavery societies. What's more, white employers openly discriminated against African-American job applicants. White policemen generally ignored people of color's complaints and usually turned a blind eye to most white on black street violence. So when children like Cornelius went missing, their parents and friends could hardly ever persuade mayors or magistrates to get involved, to do something. It was rarer still for anyone to be able to gather enough evidence to issue arrest warrants, to search property, to interrogate suspects. And even then, experienced members of these many different kidnapping crews knew exactly what to do and what to say, to talk their way out of trouble and to get back to work. Um, I can only see a few faces in the boxes because of the way my screen set up, but if you can uh, see me, uh, raise your hand if you've heard of 12 Years a Slave. 12, oh, pretty good. All the hands I can see went up, a really good sign. Um, 12 Years a Slave, um, just as a quick uh, recap, 12 Years a Slave is the name of a memoir originally, uh, written by a guy called Solomon Northup, who of course, when we think about it, is the most well-known to us person to have ever written this reverse underground railroad. Um, uh, and he had that in common with, as I said, tens of thousands of other free African Americans uh, who were kidnapped into slavery. Unlike almost all of them, Northup would eventually escape his enslavement and it took him 12 years to do it. And unlike so many others, he also wrote about it. Uh, and in that memoir, which is called 12 Years a Slave, which he wrote in 1853, yeah, Northup explains what riding the reverse underground railroad was like for him. He explains how a pair of well-dressed white confidence men lured him from his home in upstate New York in 1841 uh, into New York City. Um, and it's important to know that at the time he was kidnapped, Northup was um, fully employed, I think as a musician, he was prosperous, he was middle class, he was literate, and he was in his mid-30s. And in Manhattan, they wined, dined, and drugged him. And the next thing he knew, he'd been sold as a slave to an interstate slave trader uh, in Washington, D.C., who put him on board a slave ship bound for New Orleans. And in New Orleans, he was sold as a slave in one of that city's infamous slave markets to a planter who then put him to work picking sugarcane. In 2013, as you can see on the right, an Oscar-winning film drew overdue attention to Northup's extraordinary um, ordeal and amazing autobiography. And I think that movie, 12 Years a Slave, is a dark masterpiece of American cinema. It's purposefully very difficult to watch. That is the point. Um, but my praise for the memoir and my praise for the movie aside, both of them offer, I think, partial or distorted or maybe even misleading views of the larger phenomenon of the reverse underground railroad, of who the agents of the reverse underground railroad typically were, of the sort of people they typically targeted, and how they typically made their money. Because it turns out that in some important ways, Northup's experience was not at all typical of everyone else's. Most importantly for our purposes tonight, Kidnappers on the reverse underground railroad rarely approached highly literate middle-aged men like Northup. Kidnappers preferred instead to lure away poorly educated street kids with ruses that could swiftly separate them from their families. Very few of their captives would travel by ship to New Orleans either. 
Instead, kidnappers forced most boys and girls to trek southward on foot in small overland convoys known as coffles, after the Arabic word for caravan. Their prisoners rarely ended up in showrooms or on the auction block either. Their prisoners were vastly more likely to be sold off along the way in the interior of Alabama or the interior of Mississippi, in furtive all cash deals to hard up planters who wanted to buy more human beings but were too cheap to pay big city New Orleans slave prices. That was what was typical in the reverse Underground Railroad. And all of that is almost exactly what happened to 10-year-old Cornelius Sinclair, one of the five central figures in this new book, Stolen. In August of 1825, Cornelius and four other boys living in Philadelphia, and their names were Sam, Enos, Alex, and Joe. The five of them fell into the hands of America's most fearsome gang of kidnappers. Their captors hustled them onto that ship just outside Philadelphia that I mentioned when I began. You can see Philadelphia in the top right of this map. Their kidnappers warehoused them for a while in a pair of safe houses down on the Delaware Peninsula, the black dot right above the word Nanticote. And then their kidnappers marched them onwards on foot with no shoes, halfway across this vast continent of ours to sell them as slaves in the deep south. I'm not gonna say much more tonight about that soul-destroying journey. It's obviously a monstrous distance for anyone, let alone children. It's a journey of two million human steps. I spend a lot of time in the book trying to reconstruct what it was like. And I'm also going to be a bit maybe coy tonight about the how and why of the astonishing Odyssey home in my book's subtitle, which is to say I'm not keen to give away everything about the book's ending. I hope some of you will take a look um, at it. But what I will say here is that what did happen next to Cornelius Sinclair and to the four other boys who met basically for the first time in the belly of that little ship was indeed astonishing. It was astonishing to them as they worked to make it happen, and it was astonishing to me. It would involve two murders, three exhumations of dead bodies from the earth, an escape, a recapture, a suicide, a lawsuit, a race riot, the nation's first most wanted list, and America's largest manhunt so far. Instead of telling you the full story of what would happen next to Cornelius Sinclair and these four other boys, and I will tell you for free that four of these five boys do achieve liberty and make it home. Let me instead explain why this story has never before been fully told. Cornelius was a child at the time he went missing. He came from a hard-up family that was not the sort to leave behind many traces in libraries uh, or in archives like Providence Public Library. And this is a problem, of course, because this is not fiction. I did not make this up. Historians, we need sources to tell stories. We need lots of sources to reconstruct past lives in ways that are true and ways that are fair. And too often the lives of the many Americans who do not leave behind rich troves of papers, diaries, or letters do not get studied. Their stories do not get told because of the lack of readily available historical evidence. So to reconstruct the most basic outline of Cornelius's journey along the reverse Underground Railroad, I began with um, by ringing what I could from a small packet of letters written to or from this guy, Joseph Watson. He was the mayor of Philadelphia for a hot second. And importantly for our event tonight, from coverage of Cornelius's disappearance in a single anti-slavery newspaper in Philadelphia that took an interest from the beginning in his disappearance, an interest that almost no one else initially 
took. And it's so wonderful that that newspaper, which is called the African Observer, still survives. Now, historians have known about these two sources, the letters and the newspaper, for a while. But on their own, they're, of course, um, too thin, too few, too meager to sustain a whole book length reconstruction of what turns out to be a really complicated and fascinating um, case. So I've had to go looking elsewhere, um, digging around in almost any archive I could think of for scraps of fresh information that when put together could help me flesh this fascinating story out. Um, along the way, there's been what felt like a lot of failure at the time. Um, a lot of days in distant archives, far away from my own wife and children who are just beyond this door, um, spent finding what I thought was nothing at all. Um, to use an old metaphor, if you go looking for um, needles in haystacks, first you find a lot of hay, right? Um, and that was definitely my experience. I found a lot of hay before I started finding useful needles. But then I did start finding them, one after another after another. And over six years of research for this book, uh, I've been able to unearth more than 100 new sources about this fascinating um, case, buried within, I think, 35 different archives in 14 different states and the District of Columbia, including um, some archives uh, in Rhode Island, the uh, John Carter Brown at um, Brown University. And I'm not going to list all 100 new sources, you'll be thrilled to learn, um, but I will mention three of them, um, not least because one of them ties into our theme this evening. Um, one thing I'll mention just to give you a flavor is I did find, with the help of another historian, the handwritten notes of a trial that took place down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a trial that would determine the fate of one of these boys, the fate of Cornelius, for the rest of his life. Would Cornelius be forever free or forever enslaved? Uh, a white jury of Alabamians got to decide that. A second thing I found was something I thought I'd never find. I found two letters authored by one of the kidnappers in which he describes the gang, he names names, he describes job responsibilities, and then of course minimizes his own responsibility to the point that it's basically nothing, which is to say on that last part, he lies through his teeth. And the third source I want to show you tonight links directly to this new exhibit about news and newspapers, and it's something I mentioned earlier. It's something I found relatively early in the research process. I found it in a Philadelphia newspaper about three days after Cornelius was kidnapped, and this thing was put there by his father. And that thing is a missing persons notice, one of thousands of similar notices placed there by black parents. It's short, so let me read it um, to you. Boy Lost. The subscriber's son, Cornelius Sinclair, a colored boy, nearly 11 years old, left his father yesterday, left his friends yesterday, excuse me. And as he had no cause and had never before absented himself, it is feared he's been seduced away by some evil-minded person. My son is a very dark-skinned boy, pretty stout built, thin long fingers, his eyes are weak, his left eye is smaller than his right. Any person hearing of my son will confer a favor on his afflicted parents by giving information to my employer at the following address, Joseph Sinclair. Every time I read this missing persons ad, again, one of thousands you can find, I'm, two words jump out at me like they're written 60 foot high or written in neon, two words out of a hundred, afflicted, parents. I bet some of you have children. I have a seven-year-old and an almost four-year-old. The thought that those children could be taken from me and I wouldn't know where they were gone or how to get them back is a thought unlike anything else. It seems like the greatest understatement of the 19th century, afflicted parents. Um, before I see what questions might have appeared in the chat while I've been uh, talking, uh, let me wrap up with a couple of brief reflections about why I think learning about America's reverse Underground Railroad is important and why Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider on this railroad is worth 
is worth your time. To begin with, I would argue forcefully, then as now, that black lives matter and that families belong together. And so any documented case of free American children being ripped from their families, in this case swallowed up by American slavery, is a story worth documenting and telling for its own sake. But the remarkable ordeal that Cornelius and his four fellow captives endured also demands our attention for many other reasons. For one thing, it serves as a pointed reminder that in the decades before the Civil War, child snatching was heartbreakingly frequent and black freedom was achingly fragile. It demonstrates too the important role that this grotesque trade in kidnapped free persons played in accelerating the spread of American slavery into the Deep South over this critical period. Now, as I said, I'm not going to preview everything about the second half of the book, which has a way more optimistic and upbeat tone than some of the opening chapters. Um, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened to Cornelius Sinclair after he was kidnapped and trafficked to Tuscaloosa. Uh, but in case you don't read the book, I will drop a few big hints here. Um, I will say that the dogged efforts of everyone involved in trying to save him and these four other boys from the horrors of slavery in the Southwest would have profound consequences. The rescue efforts of parents and allies and the aftermath of their campaign would radicalize black communities across the Northern states, across the free states, emboldening African-Americans to embrace violence in the cause of self-defense and the cause of mutual protection as almost never before in American history. The efforts would, let's see if my slides work, let's try that again. There's supposed to be a slide coming up, but I can't make it work. You guys can all still see me, right? That's good, okay. Um, I may have to exit the screen and come back. Oh God, now what's happened? All right, let's just go to the next slide and come right back. I think this is gonna work, bear with me. I think you can now see a new slide with a giant K on it, is that correct? Then we're back on track. I apologize for that uh, technical glitch. This is the world we live in now with Zoom, right? So I was talking about the most immediate consequences for members of the black community, uh, embracing all forms of self-defense. And then I was going on to say that the efforts of parents and rescuers um, would also reshape the rest of the American anti-slavery movement as well um, by encouraging the many white abolitionists with access to a printing press or the tools of newspapers and journalism to begin focusing the Northern reading public's attention on the suffering of black families being forcibly separated by kidnapping, by slave traders, and by slavery itself. And what you're looking at, of course, if you haven't figured it out, is one page from a children's anti-slavery alphabet, where the abolitionist author hits that theme, trying to reach the children of apathetic Northern whites in hopes that those children will ask their parents tough questions about which side of history they stand on. So that, that's a long-term consequence of this case as well. And the focus in anti-slavery writing and journalism on the separation of black families will become arguably the dominant motif of anti-slavery writing in the decades after 1825. But most immediately, outrage over the abduction of these five boys would force lawmakers in Pennsylvania to, pu to push through a tough new anti-kidnapping law. That 1826 law, it's called a personal liberty law, would enrage Southern slaveholders more than any other state law passed before the Civil War. 
that 1826 anti-kidnapping personal liberty law would set in motion a chain of court challenges against it by pro-slavery folks, a series of political challenges to it by pro-slavery folks that would culminate in the passage through Congress of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, a nakedly pro-slavery abomination of a law that put this country on a collision course with civil war within a decade afterwards. Cornelius Sinclair's particular experience as a rider on the reverse Underground Railroad was the result of the confluence of massive economic and political forces. And what happened to him and the many things that he and the boys made happen next would, as I've just hinted, usher in a new chapter in the history of slavery and freedom in the United States. But that lasting legacy should never be allowed to obscure the urgent and important human stakes of this small story. A 10 year old boy and four other free children were dragged into slavery in 1825. They would have to fight like hell to try to escape it. Thanks very much indeed. I'm looking forward to wrestling with the chat button now and seeing what um, questions or comments uh, there might be. Okay, the first one I see, just in case er everyone's interested, um, a note from one of our audience members uh, telling me something I didn't know, which is that Solomon North's father, whose name is Mintus, I hope I'm saying that right, was born in 1772 and held captive in North Kingston. Is it Kingston or Kingstown? Uh, Ro Rhode Island. So there's a strong Rhode Island connection I personally was um, unaware of here. And one thing I didn't mention is um, there's several, there's many, many amazing things that happen in the second half of this uh, book involving what I referred to as the largest manhunt so far in American history. It's a manhunt that sees um, a Philadelphia policeman chase kidnappers across the country all the way to Boston, and he gets one in Boston. He apprehends one of this gang and he drags him back to Philadelphia, passing through Rhode Island. I'm sorry I can't do better than passing through, but that's what history uh, is. Um, there's a question here um, from uh, an audience member. It says, it seems that the case and the trials got a lot of press and attention at the time and had an influence on abolitionist writers, among other le legacies. How did it disappear so thoroughly from general memory. Why don't we know more about this story, which had such a rare um, outcome? And that's a wonderful um, question. Because one thing I learned in the course of researching this book is that people at the time, in meaning Philadelphia, meaning the 1820s, meaning other northern cities too, were well aware that these kidnappings were going on. And they were well aware that this particular kidnapping uh, had gone on. And um, two years into the story of this particular case, it did finally begin to receive significant press coverage and legal attention from someone like the mayor of Philadelphia. And it's those journalist sources and legal sources um, that allow me to reconstruct the case and tell this story. But it's also true, as the questioner points out in the chat, um, that this particular case and the larger phenomenon of the reverse Underground Railroad, I think are not widely known um, today. To put that another way, I certainly um, had never come across this case before I stumbled on it. And to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, I was at best dimly aware, despite being a card carrying professional historian of this phenomenon of kidnapping free black Americans into slavery in the decades before the Civil War. If you come up to me on the street in 2011, uh, on the day before I started this project, and said, have you heard of Solomon Northup? I would nod my head shakily like I knew what you were talking about, because uh, I hadn't read his memoir in five years. Um, if, if you'd said to me, did things like that kidnapping of that free guy Northup happen all the time, or was it a rare one-off? I would have um, hated the question and probably plumped for the answer that it was a rare thing that happened just to a couple of people on the fringes of American slavery and that Northup was unlucky 
the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. But over the past six, seven, eight, nine years, however long it's been, um, it's become so obvious to me from digging into the archives and finding the types of sources that I mentioned in my talk tonight, that this phenomenon, while not well known now, was extremely common and extremely well known at the time. We've forgotten about it for lots of reasons. Uh, one, because it deals with criminals who tried to minimize the paper traces and paper trails of evidence they left behind them, that most kidnappers were never arrested, apprehended, uh, no policeman from Philadelphia chased them um, all the way to Boston and back. And so most kidnappings do not generate the source of the types of sources that historians generally rely on. It's also true that this is a dark and difficult chapter in American history, right? Um, this is not something, um, this is not a story we tell ourselves, especially in northern states like Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or even Rhode Island, that can make us feel good about um, what life was like in our states in the free north before the Civil War. It turns out that black lives, um, could, that black people in northern towns and cities could have legal freedom, but that didn't mean much if that freedom was in daily jeopardy by kidnappers. And it also didn't mean much, by the way, of course, if you couldn't get a job, if you couldn't find a church that would take black worshippers, if you couldn't find a school um, for your kids, right? You can end slavery in any state, but that's, as we're finding out and reminding ourselves today, that's of course not the same as ending racism and dismantling white supremacy, which was endemic everywhere um, for far too long. Um, okay, here we go. Here's another question. Um, Rhode Island was involved in every aspect of slavery, including its congressional members voting for the expansion of slavery into Western states. What do you think white Americans owe African Americans at this very moment? So I'll pick up on the first part of that uh, first because history is what I'm paid to do and um, contemporary political policy is not something I'm paid to, um, to talk about. Um, it's absolutely true, as the questioner points out, that uh, several of the northern states um, had strong financial interests, economic interests, in seeing slavery thrive, expand, and grow as the nation added new territories and states in the decades after the American um, Revolution. Uh, there is a symbiosis, a mutual dependence between the North and the South, economically speaking, by the eve of the Civil War. Um, so that raw materials produced in the South by slaves, I'm thinking here most notably of cotton, but also of things like tobacco and sugar as well, that those raw materials can be transported to Northern factory towns and mill towns, including those in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, for processing, value adding, export and sale. Uh, that Rhode Island's prosperity depends on the cotton crop in Alabama. That's true for shipbuilders in a place like Rhode Island uh, in particular. Um, so it's not a stark divide between the good north and the bad south, between the free soil of the north and the slave soil of the south. What do you think white Americans owe African Americans at this very moment? Um, I can't speak for any other uh, white, white Americans, um, but I'm certainly one myself, despite this British accent. Um, I became a naturalized US citizen um, about two years ago. There was a major presidential election in this country, and suddenly I really wanted to vote in the next one. Um, and so I became a US citizen because I've been in this country for 20 years. Uh, I'm married to a real American from Missouri of all places. And we have two terrifyingly American children who only do a British accent when they're trying to make fun of their father, which is all the time. Um, but I am one of these white Americans now. So all I can say is the responsibility that, that I feel, um, which is um, to talk honestly and candidly about how we came to this place and this time we now live in and to refuse to participate in amnesia about how we reached this place, to refuse to participate in any presentist notion that the world we live in now was invented out of whole cloth in 1985 and the world before that has no connection to the way we live now. Because that's not true, right? Um, 
Slavery is the most obvious tool of racial oppression in American history, but it's one tool out of many, and white supremacy has taken any number of forms. After race slavery is abolished in the carnage of civil war, we see the rise of um, sharecropping, um, of peonage, of uh, Jim Crow era um, segregations, of the war on drugs, uh, the rise of mass incarceration. These are all demonstrably um, other expressions of the same um, impulses. And to face that legacy and look it in the eye is something that I want to do, and I hope uh, many other folks uh, do as well. Are there any other questions or comments? So if there aren't, uh, let me say I'm happy to continue this conversation privately over email with anyone watching um, today. It's always uh, a joy to talk to people who are interested in American history, especially its dark chapters that other people might shy away from. Um, if you're interested in buying a signed copy of my book, you should be able to see my email on the screen. Um, there's also a wonderful um, non-Amazon, non-Jeff Bezos option, uh, which Janaea has put in the chat. I think it's called bookshop.org. The link may not look like that, but if you click on it, that's where it will um, take you. Um, I want to thank Janaea for uh, doing the tech wizardry that made this possible. And I want to thank uh, Christina for this opportunity to talk to all of you uh, in Rhode Island and maybe around the world um, this evening about this uh, subject. It's been a pleasure uh, and an honor. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Christina, do you want to say anything else before we wrap? She's muted. She can't. Um, just thank you so much, Rick. Um, I, I, it took us a while. I think we started communicating in the fall um, shortly after the book came out and so much has changed but it's really wonderful that we were able to um, bring your work and I just really really highly recommend um, the book it, it's a total page turner and I feel that it should only be a matter of time before it is made into a movie because it's just an incredible story and very very as Rick was talking about at the end very very relevant to the moment that we're in right now so um, thank you again so much all right. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. You too. Thanks. Bye.